Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. A 22-year-old woman is eight months pregnant and is supposed to be on bed rest. Instead, she called a friend and asked her to drive her to help run some errands. On May 3rd, 2017, Akia Eggleston went to several banks and ATMs and withdrew large sums of money. Then all activity on her social media stopped. But it wouldn't be until four days later when she failed to show up to her own baby shower that her family would realize she was missing. Now, five years later, Akia and her baby haven't been found, but a man is on trial for their murder. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Akia Eggleston and the trial of Michael Robertson. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is, and then they were gone. everyone welcome back thank you for joining us after our absence we appreciate you coming back yeah i guess i'm probably to blame for that no it was me it was like all of my sicknesses back to back to back but the reason we're recording in a hotel is your fault (laughs) yes but we can't talk about that we can't talk about that um but just know that i uh snuck in this recording during ethan's extended absences We do have regular episodes coming to you uh, as well. Again, we're going to get back on our schedule. But today we are coming because the trial of Michael Robertson, Akia Eggleston's ex-boyfriend, is currently underway in Baltimore. He was arrested in 2022, nearly five years after Akia was last seen. Baltimore released the probable cause affidavit, and we brought you a bonus episode right after the arrest. I've re-released it, so you can listen to it. It's right next to this one in your feed if you need a refresher in this case. So this week, I'm only going to briefly go over the circumstances around Akia's disappearance and the evidence that led to Robertson's arrest. What we're really going to focus on is what we've learned so far in the trial, which is basically the prosecution's case. A good deal of the early testimony was facts that were relayed in the PC affidavit, which we cover heavily in that bonus episode that I mentioned. So uh, we're not going to go over that in detail. Like we're going to kind of stick with the new revelations that have come out. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Let's get into it. All right. Let's get started. So as I mentioned, Akia was eight months pregnant and supposed to be on bed rest um, on May 3rd of 2017. But she was going out and about. She went to several banks basically because she was supposed to be getting money for a security deposit and other expenses for a new apartment she was going to move into with her boyfriend and the father of her child, Michael Robertson. Now, Akia already had a two-year-old daughter uh, from a previous relationship. And on this day, she was with family members. Baltimore police basically did nothing to find her after she was reported missing. And, you know, to be fair, they were a little bit behind the eight ball because nobody quite realized she was missing until about four days later when she didn't show up to her baby shower. But even then, they really, in my opinion, put in very little effort. It wasn't until 2021 when Akia's story started receiving national press, most notably being featured in People magazine and in the HBO docuseries Black and Missing, that they seemingly decided to thoroughly investigate the case. Let's use air quotes with the thoroughly, please. Well, I mean, it did lead to an arrest, so... There was that. I mean, it could because in 2021, it does seem that's when things really kind of kicked into gear. Although, as we will talk about later in this episode, it does appear that there was some behind the scenes work prior to that. So I am, you know, going to be fair. But it it just really seems so investigators finally keyed into the fact that this case was eminently solvable and that people were starting to pay attention and not just in Baltimore, you know, people were 
starting to pay attention on a national scale. So about six months after, you know, IKEA story appeared on Black and Missing and all this, and we did an episode and a bunch of other, you know, podcasts and news outlets started covering the case, they were finally able to make an arrest. On February 2nd, 2022, police arrested Michael Robertson, IKEA's boyfriend and the father of her unborn child at his home in Michigan. He was charged with two counts of first degree murder and two counts of second degree murder. He was extradited back to Baltimore, Maryland. In May of 2022, Akia and her unborn baby, whom she was going to name Anubis, were added to the list of Baltimore's homicide victims. Michael Robertson has several children and was in a relationship with a woman with whom he had two children while he was also dating Akia. These children and relationships, both current and previous, in my opinion, point toward a potential motive. And we really talked about this in the bonus episode. It was also known at the time of her disappearance, too. Yeah, none of this was new information whatsoever. From what I've been able to tell, and even, you know, after learning what's been the prosecution's case in this trial, like all of this information was available in 2017. Right. There were later interviews that were done with Robertson, which, you know, were entered into ev- evidence, obviously, but those could have been done earlier. Yeah. But the big thing that, you know, I found out from just basic court record research is that in 2004, a woman who I won't identify, but also has the last name Robertson, made a complaint for unpaid child support. It appears that he basically never showed up to any of the hearings. And the case was eventually closed in 2005. But then later she tried again. Now, it seems as though he had made some payments but still owed her money. And another complaint for support was filed on November 23rd, 2005. He appears to have blown this off again and a request for a hearing slash trial was made in July. In October, there was an order establishing support and the case was closed. But they were back in circuit court in 2008 instead of family court, where it appears that she was suing him for support. That case was closed, and it appears that some sort of payment was made. Then in 2011, another woman, whom I'll call D, made a complaint for support against Robertson. That case appears to have been dismissed in November of that year. The next month, the Howard County Department of Social Services made the same complaint for support. Robertson dodged them, though, and that case was closed in May of 2012. But in February of 2013, they tried again. When Robertson still refused to show up, a warrant was issued for his arrest. He was arrested and let go in April. The petition for support was dismissed in July, but there's no reason given. In 2015, they issued yet another summons, which was repeatedly unable to be served because Robertson continued to dodge his responsibilities. They were finally able to track him down and serve the summons on July 26, 2016. There were reports and notices filed after that that Robertson did not respond to. But in December of 2016, an order establishing support was issued. In November of 2016, a month before that, a third woman filed a complaint against Robertson and a support establishment hearing was scheduled for December 27th, 2016, but it kept getting continued. Now, I'm guessing these continuances were granted because he wasn't showing up just like in the previous cases. And like in those previous cases, several summonses were issued and hearings were set. Robertson was supposed to have a support arraignment hearing on May 8th, 2017, just days after Ikea's disappearance. He did not show. On August 4th, 2017, the arraignment was rescheduled and the subpoena, a writ of summons, and a copy of the complaint to establish child support were ordered to be reissued. It wasn't able to be served. And on November 3rd, 2017, the complaint was dismissed without prejudice meaning it could be reopened at a later date if Robertson decided to come back from Michigan, where he had moved earlier in 2017. So that's kind of where we are, right? By the end of 2016, Robertson had three different women in the Howard County Department of Social Services who had been trying to get him to pay child support for over a decade. 
In addition to that, he had two children with a fourth woman, and now Akia was pregnant. Michael Robertson was not the type of guy who wanted to take responsibility for his children. In my opinion, it seems as though the combination of his existing legal troubles and money owed combined with the prospect of a fifth woman asking him for money was potentially his breaking point. Robertson moved to Michigan with his girlfriend, Haley Pomeroy, and their two children shortly after Akia's disappearance. The probable cause affidavit stated that Robertson didn't want to obtain ID or get a job. And so because I had read that affidavit, the probable cause affidavit before I'd done this research. And so I assumed that he was trying to stay under the radar because of Akia's case. But more likely, while that would have been part of it, I'm sure, he was just trying to avoid all of this child support stuff that he had going back in on in Maryland. Because I know it is harder when you leave the state, but I'm sure that if he had like gotten a job and everything in Michigan... It's not impossible for them to track him down and garnish his wages. Right. And so I think the easier option for him was just to not get a job or at least not... Do it, do it under the table. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of what we knew going into this trial. This trial was originally slated to begin in October of 2022, but got delayed until July 12th, 2023. So now let's get into what we know about the trial so far. The first day of the trial was mainly devoted to witnesses talking about the events leading up to them realizing Akia was was missing. So basically everything that we covered in our original Akia Eggleston episode. They talked about the baby shower and the planning of the baby shower and, you know, how she was supposed to show up and she didn't. And then people became worried and they talked about the search. Her grandmother testified about how she was supposed to make food for Akia's baby shower on May 7th, 2017, but Akia never got back to her to tell her what kind of food she wanted. Several of Akia's friends also testified, I'm sure about the baby shower and all of that, but they were also asked about Michael Robertson and how they felt about him. The general consensus was they were not fans. Weird. Yeah. One friend testified that he made Akia's life a living hell. And that was a quote. On cross-examination, the defense started to float their theories of what happened to Akia, saying that other men had access to her apartment and that she had also previously expressed interest in moving to Atlanta or New York. Just... By herself. Sure, yeah. When you're eight months pregnant, don't tell anybody. I mean, where did that come from? Apparently, she had said it before (laughs) at some point (laughs) in her life. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, it shouldn't come to anyone's surprise that the crux of the defense's case is that he can't be guilty of murder because we don't know that she's dead. So they're just going to make all of these false claims saying that she just moved away. They're just saying it's a possibility, right? I mean, what they're trying to do is just get enough reasonable doubt so he's not convicted, right? And and no body homicide cases are difficult, to be sure. They're not easy cases, but there is a lot of circumstantial evidence in this one, which, of course, we're going to talk about. Day two of the trial focused on Akia's trips to the bank and the last known video captured of the pregnant mother. One new piece of information that I find to be absolutely infuriating is that Akia's baby, would, as we did know, was going to be named Anubis Robertson. I did not know she was putting on giving the baby his last name, which is terrible already. But Michael Robertson's cousin testified that Robertson has an interest in Egyptian mythology and that Robertson was the one who chose the baby's name which is clearly an honor he did not deserve. What's worse is that Anubis, the name he chose for his child, is the Egyptian god of the dead. Anubis's goal is to guide the dead into the beyond. That's really fucked up. Yeah. At the beginning of the trial, the prosecution said that they plan to call over 70 witnesses to the stand, including family members and friends of both Akia and Robertson, as well as some of Robertson's former girlfriends. 
On day four, the detective who performed Robertson's first interview testified that Robertson told him that he had no idea where Akia was, but that she had a relative in Arizona that she could visit if needed. I mean, she had a ton of family in Maryland where she lived. Right. And where her child was staying on the day she went missing. But, you know, Arizona. Yeah, um, maybe she went out there. It's a dry heat. Le- left her other child. On day five, jurors watched Robertson's second formal interview, which took place on October 19th, 2017. This is the interview in which Robertson was told that he's a suspect in Akia's murder and that he has the, quote, opportunity to tell them what happened. He did not take it. Instead, he continued to insist that he didn't know where she was. He was officially a suspect in October of 2017, and it took four and a half years to get an arrest. With no new evidence in between. No additional evidence whatsoever. Just just the sudden realization that maybe they should push this Mm -hmm. because they're being featured on HBO. Right. The next day of trial featured FBI Special Agent Matthew Wild, who was the cellular expert who examined Ikea's phone, as well as those of Robertson and his girlfriend, Haley. He testified that Ikea's last outgoing phone call was placed at 3.44 p.m. on May 3, 2017, to Michael Robertson's phone number. In each of the episodes in which I've talked about this case, I've given major shit to the Baltimore PD and their lack of investigation. We also did this approximately 30 seconds ago. But what I will say, in fairness, is that the FBI was involved earlier than I realized. I honestly assumed that they didn't get involved until uh, after the case got national attention in 2021. But in 2019, the agent who had already been in charge of the case doing something, who knows, he retired and a new agent, Special Agent Summer Baugh, took over as the lead investigator on the case. Now, as most investigators do when they take over a new case, she started from scratch and reviewed all of the evidence gathered up to that point. And she decided, based on that, that she needed to re-interview Robertson, who by that point had moved to Michigan with Haley and their kids. Body cam footage was shown in court of her and another investigator knocking on his door in Michigan and speaking with him for about a half an hour. Now, I just want to mention, you know, different jurisdictions have different rules when it comes to trials. Some allow audio recordings, some allow video recordings. Baltimore does not. (laughs) So unfortunately, we don't have like specific information about what was on that video. Day seven was an impactful day of testimony. If you recall, the prosecution's theory of the case is that Akio was murdered and Michael Robertson dumped her body in a dumpster. A garbage truck driver took the stand and testified that their trucks are not equipped with GPS and they would have had no way of seeing whether or not Akia's body was in the dumpster when they picked up the trash. This testimony was used by the prosecution to explain why Akia's body and that of her unborn baby have never been found. The defense, of course, claims that their client can't be convicted of murder because there is no evidence that Akia and Anubis are dead. The prosecution also played a 75-minute interrogation video of Robertson. In it, he cried and rocked in his chair while saying that he loved Akia in the past tense, while also denying that they were in a relationship in the first place. Oh, wow. So he's, he's just completely writing them off. He loved her, but they weren't in a relationship, but they also had a child together. Well, he went on to say in this interview that they, quote, met at a party sometime in July 2016, but insisted that they, quote, literally had sex one time, end quote. Investigators pressed him on when that one time was, and he finally said it was, quote, sometime in September 2016. He went on to say, quote, so when she told me she was pregnant and how far along, I was like, wait a minute, how can I be the father? The timeline just didn't fit. So yes, he was completely blowing off the relationship, saying that it wasn't a relationship. It was a one night stand and that 
he wasn't even the father because to him, the math didn't add up. And I'm obviously not a mathematician, nor do I believe that they only had sex one time. But it should be noted that Akia's due date was in June of 2017. So if they did have sex one time in 2016 in September, like that still works. On day eight, jurors watched more interrogation video. And in this video, investigators asked Robertson repeatedly about his whereabouts and actions on May 2nd and 3rd of 2017. Remember, Akia's phone made its last call to Robertson's phone at 344 on May 3rd. After that, she sent a Facebook message at 522 to someone inviting them to her baby shower. Robertson's version of what happened that day is that he and Akia had a discussion and ended their relationship, the one that he had previously said they didn't have, after she asked him to choose between her and his girlfriend, Haley. Oh, and it should also, I left this out um, because this was like on the first day, I believe, of um, testimony. They brought Haley up on the stand and she testified that she and Akia had previously had a physical altercation about all of this, obviously. It is a relationship. It's not a relationship. There was a physical altercation between his current girlfriend and Akia. He loved her in the past tense. They had a discussion to end the relationship and she just happened to go missing. That's kind of where we are at this point. So after he tells the investigators that they had this discussion, this, you know, I'm sure very reasonable discussion, and decided to part ways, they asked, what did he do after that? He said nothing. He said, I don't know where she went. I don't know what happened. And he said, quote, I didn't do nothing to her, end quote. Investigators also presented him with evidence that both his and Akia's phones were together and traveling to downtown Baltimore early in the evening of May 3rd. So after this discussion and after he claims he doesn't know where she went. So what was his reaction to that? He denied making the trip. And, and during this time period, when his phone was with Ikea's phone, texts were being sent from his phone to his girlfriend, Haley. And the phones are together? Yes. So he's just like... Nah, science doesn't exist. Yeah, he said, no, I wasn't there. I didn't go anywhere with Ikea after that. Certainly not to downtown Baltimore. At some point during this, Ikea's phone dies and has never been recovered. On day nine, the state entered two recorded prison calls into evidence and then rested their case. And that's where we are right now as of this recording. We are literally recording this like the day after the prosecution rests their case. So this is what we know up until this point. And like I said, a lot of it um, we did already know based on the probable cause affidavit. But, you know, it's good to just know that they have a lot more cell phone evidence backing up, you know, that they were together after he said that they were. Yeah, I mean... That's damnable in and of itself. Yeah. And then you know? there's there's other evidence um, that I talk about in the previous episode of like him basically sending other messages, you know, from her Facebook account and things like that. Like he he was doing a lot. What was what was the cross? Uh, uh, I, I would be curious on as far as what was what the cross was for the whole. Oh, your cell phones were together after i know i unfortunately i don't know because there just isn't a ton of information about this case unfortunately it's not quite as high profile as some others although it is certainly more high profile than it was in 2017 so i just don't have a lot of the details that i would like but you know we're going to Keep on bringing you what we can get, what I can find from people who are able to be in the courtroom. So we will bring you more updates. Um, You know, they'll probably be shorter episodes, uh, but the trial is expected to last three to four weeks. Prosecution took about two weeks to uh, present their case. I have a feeling that much as in the trial of Trezell and Jacqueline West, the defense's case will not take as long. I mean... (laughs) <laughs> given they have nothing. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see what they have, other than you can't prove that she's dead. 
Right. Like, I don't know what other refutations they have to this. So we'll find that out. We will bring you the defense's case and uh, hopefully the verdict. Okay, just kidding. Uh, we're back. <laughs> on, yeah, on it very unexpectedly. Yeah, we're actually recording this part on Friday, July 28th, the day that this is being released, because uh, things took a turn that I wasn't expecting. After the prosecution rested on Tuesday, July 25th, I assumed that the defense would take at least a few days to present their case. Then the jury would get it, and we'd probably get a verdict on Monday. And so my plan was to do part two the following Friday. Instead, let me quote in its entirety WMAR's coverage of the defense's case. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious as to what they said. Yes, this is uh, the entirety of it. Quote, Defense counsel for Michael Robertson brought no witnesses and no additional evidence before arresting its case Tuesday morning as well. End quote. So that's it. That is it. So we have no idea what they actually said. I mean, like... They didn't say anything. They didn't get up. They didn't present any more um, any more witnesses. So all they did was, you know, a cross-examination of the witnesses. Where they tried to instill some sort of reasonable doubt that sh- that he didn't kill her because there's no body. Correct. And for all of you avid Dateline listeners out there... You've seen this before because typically the the defense, when they don't bring a case, they'll say correctly that it is the state who has the burden of proof and the defense doesn't actually need to present any evidence or any witnesses or anything like that if they believe the state has not thoroughly proven beyond a reasonable doubt that their client is guilty then that's it. That's all that they need. That is a huge, huge risk to take. It is. And um, again, going back to Dateline, the episodes that I can think of where the defense has done that have not worked out well for the defense. Mm, All of those people are in jail. So strange. Yeah. So both sides rested on Tuesday. On Wednesday, which is day 10 of the trial, both the state and the defense presented their closing arguments. ASA Kurt Bjorklund's closing tried to drive home the point that just because Robertson was good at hiding a body doesn't mean he should be acquitted. Because that's the the prosecution's biggest weakness is the fact that Ikea right. has never There's been no found. Body. Right. Sure. So but you know, he's just saying like that's not enough of a reason to ignore all of the other evidence. Right. Of which there's a lot, in my opinion. Well, I mean, the biggest thing for me was the fact that his cell phone and her cell phone were pinged together right? after she disappeared. Yeah, after he says that... Nothing happened. That nothing they happened. They had a conversation and he ended left. the quote-unquote relationship that wasn't a relationship. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. that. Uh, come on. Yeah. Robertson's defense attorney, Jason Rodriguez, told the jury, quote, it just doesn't make sense, meaning the case. He absolutely 100% did not kill Akia, end quote. In his opinion. I mean, I <laughs> like, guess. Like, it doesn't like make what s- doesn't make sense? Yeah, like all of the evidence actually does make sense in relation to him killing her. Yeah, all I mean, that's points- the only thing that makes sense. Like, yes. that's the thing. It's like, if even if you don't get too far into the actual evidence, which I'm glad, you know, they obviously did and and it's good evidence, but just common sense right i mean it it makes more sense than anything else but you're gonna love this he also claimed that there are alternate suspects out there with more of a motive that he didn't bother to present a trial correct yes and because he called zero witnesses to further this theory right and like that's common to present alternative suspects as as a defense yeah. Like that gives you reasonable doubt. That gives the jurors reasonable doubt. No, exactly. And and what alternative suspects too? Because I mean, Akia's family has long suspected Robertson, but you know, there was a time, especially at the beginning, I think, where they didn't know what had happened to her and and they were open minded as to other suspects, but like 
no other suspects ever emerged in the six years since she's been missing. Right. So if the defense is claiming that there are alternative suspects, they should have presented them at trial. Yeah. And I feel like they also would have just come up in the conversation by now. For sure. Sean Wilkinson, Akia's stepfather who raised her, was right on in his assessment as he spoke to reporters during the lunch break. He said, quote, I think the state is dead on. I think there's no argument for the defense. Obviously, the defense has to do their job and poke holes in the prosecution's case. And right now, I think they are running in circles and trying to confuse the jury, but I don't think the jury is buying it. End quote. Closing arguments wrapped up and jurors had about an hour to deliberate before being sent home around 515. They reconvened Thursday morning and deliberated for about another hour before coming to a verdict. On Thursday, July 27th, 2023, the jury returned its verdict. Michael Robertson was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder for Akia and his unborn son, Anubis. Sentencing is scheduled for October 25th, 2023. He faces two life sentences in prison. This is the case of a missing black woman in Baltimore. There was no body and no physical evidence, yet with focused police work, prosecutors were able to secure a guilty verdict. And not justice, because justice would be a Kia and Anubis living their lives, but they were at least able to get something approximating it. This all came about because of media attention. I truly believe that Michael Robertson would still be lying on a couch in Michigan if people hadn't started making noise about Akia's case. That's why it's so important to not let these stories go untold. When you see a post about a missing person on social media, share it. If it doesn't seem like a case is getting enough attention, amplify it. Be the squeaky wheel. Akia's family never stopped pushing. They never stopped trying to find her. There are so many families out there who are just like hers, and they need our support. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!